A warm welcome to our OADN I Teach platform. Our speaker today is Optom Najia. She graduated with BS Optometry from ESO in 2012 and completed her MPhil in Optometry from ESO in 2015. She is currently pursuing her doctoral studies in Erasmus MC, not, not Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and she is a research associate at Medical Research Foundation Chennai. Her doctoral research is focused on evaluating pupillary dynamics and eye movement behavior in neurodegenerative diseases. She has successfully transferred her scientific findings into peer-reviewed publication and has presented her work at various national and international scientific platforms. Uh, she is actively involved in providing academic guidance in clinical as well as research activities of undergraduate and postgraduate optometry students at Eli School of Optometry and the Shankar Netralaya Academy. She is a research advisory member on the project titled Development of Prototype based on eye tracking technology to evaluate oculomotor function that is based in Norway. She has bagged many accolades like Young Clinical Mentor in 2019, Luxottica Excellence Award for Research Methodology in 2015, and around 14 awards during her undergraduation. She is also the recipient of a number of research awards and active and active in international presentations as presenting author, co-author, and oral presentation. Uh, she has immensely contributed in various lectures, seminars, and workshops conducted by ESO, uh, the Shankar Netralaya Academy, OATN, uh, Indian Optometry Association in Kerala, and Vasan Institute of Ophthalmology and Research and Optometry Association of Assam. Her topic today is automated visual field, report reading and recent advances. I request the audience to type the questions in the chat box below and it will be answered after uh, at the end of this session. A very warm welcome to our speaker, Optom Najia. First of all, thank you so much to Lekamam for such a sweet introduction. And uh, I'm extremely honored to be on the iTeach platform and my heartfelt thanks to OATN for having me here today. For the major perimetry, uh, by focusing on how to interpret a Humphrey field analyzer report and a very brief note on the advances in the field of perimetry. A small disclosure, I understand this is a diverse group of audience, including not only the experienced clinical practitioners, but also optometry students and budding clinicians. Hence, uh, this session is basically set at a very simple elementary level of perimetry technique and interpretation. So, of course, to at least some of you, it might be just a revision or review of uh, basics. So moving on to the topic, uh, the best introduction to start with is, of course, the definition of visual field. When our eyes are directed straight forward and focused on a central point, the total area in which the objects can be seen in the central and peripheral vision is referred to as the visual field. So if we look straight, stretch our hands and this way, which you are seeing on the left side, hitting 180 degrees, we will be able to appreciate an area that is around 160 degrees, majority of the area being the binocular field, and this small 20 degree that you are seeing at the edge belonging to the right and left eye monocular fields. So if we divide our visual area into four different quadrants, say temporal, nasal, superior, and inferior, the extent of temporal field is the maximum, that is around 100 degrees, whereas the other th three quadrants are restricted to around 50 to 60 degrees due to the nose, forehead, and the cheekbone. As we all know, when light rays enter the ocular media, it is captured by the retinal layer that contains millions of light sensing nerve cells and are translated into a series of electrical signals or impulses. This visual information is then propagated along the optic nerve to the visual areas located in the posterior section of the brain. Therefore, the 
detection of visual stimuli within our visual field relies on the intactness of the neural pathway. So any structural loss or damage in any of the parts belonging to this particular pathway will show a corresponding visual field defect. Why did I say corresponding is because just imagine if the retinal surface is subdivided by vertical and horizontal lines that intersect at the center of the fovea. Horizontal line divides the retina into superior and inferior div divisions and the uh, vertical lines dividing the retina into nasal and temporal division. Now let's just assume there is an imaginary vertical and horizontal line in the visual space as well. That is called the meridians that intersect at the point of fixation. So the point of fixation is that point in visual space that the fovea is aligned with and defining the quadrants of the visual field. So light that is diverging from different points of an object cross over at the refractive surface of the eye that causes the images of objects in the visual field to be inverted and light left right reversed from the retinal surface when the rays get focused. For example, objects in the temporal part of the visual field are seen by the nasal part of the retina and the objects in the superior part of the visual field are seen in the inferior part of the retina like this. Okay. So clinically, how do we evaluate the extent and integrity of the visual field are using a systematic technique and we call it perimetry. These methods are used for the diagnosis of various ocular conditions and also for evaluating their progression. Based on the method of testing, the perimetry technique can be either manual or automated. While most of the perimeters require an examiner to administer the test, the manual method particularly demands a greater interaction between the examiner and the, and the patient. Why? because it needs manual presentation of the stimulus as well as documenting the patient responses. Whereas in automated perimetry, it offers obvious advantages over manual perimetry as in that stimulus presentation as well as the recording of patient responses are standardized using computer algorithms. That will give us more reproducible uh, results. Even though we should remember the manual perimetry methods like confrontation or tangent screen, etc., is still useful in certain situations, especially while dealing with the individuals who uh, really cannot adapt well to the automated interface. So what we do during a visual field examination is visual targets which are stationary, that are static, or targets that are moving, that is kinetic, is used to evaluate the sensitivity of the visual system. This is basically two different strategies of stimulus projection. So when the used target is a moving one, we call it kinetic perimetry, for example, Goldman kinetic perimetry. And when the target is stationary, we call it static perimetry, for example, octopus, Humphrey Villain, etc. So today, our prime focus is on the Humphrey field analyzer. I will use the abbreviation HFA. In HFA, while the patient focuses at a central fixation target, the analyzer randomly projects a series of circular white light of varying brightness throughout a uniformly illuminated bulb. Whenever the patient appreciates a light in the near periphery, they indicate it by pressing a handheld button. This measures the retinal sensitivity by estimating its ability to detect the stimulus at specific points within the tested visual field. Uh, instead of making the uh, contents in a linear format, I'm taking a bit of non-sequential turn. So we first begin with a report generated by HFA and then subsequently discuss what all we come across in a printout. So this is how a regular HFA report looks like. And here I would like to tell you about an acronym, WANDA, uh, just to keep in mind, probably useful while dealing with an HFA report. Uh, 
it is not only uh, it, it's definitely not a universally accepted or used acronym though but still uh, so we have to first see who or what that includes the patient and test details then a for accuracy or presence of artifacts third whether the report is normal or abnormal if abnormal then what is the defect factor evaluate all the components and interpret confirm the interpretation by reviewing and correlating with the other clinical characteristics for easy and systematic interpretation of the visual field printout we divide it into eight zones so here we go one by one before we begin with zones please remember the reversal of quadrants i was mentioning at the beginning so retinal areas and the visual field areas are reversed hence in order to avoid any sort of confusion while interpreting the report i would recommend you to first see which eyes report is that you're holding so it will be mentioned uh, here on the top right of the report then spot where is the location of the blind spot what is a blind spot it is that area in the visual field corresponding to the optic nerve head which is devoid of any photoreceptors hence an absolute scotoma since the location of optic nerve head is on the nasal retina in the report it is going to be on the temporal field so please remember if it is a right eye report hold it on your right hand hold it in your right hand and if it is the left eye report hold it in your left hand uh, let's begin with zone 1 that displays patient demographics and test data that means zone 1 is telling what zone 1 is telling us is which test has been performed and on who let's go into the details of zone 1 what all detail we get regarding the patient we see name and id it is really really important especially in a busy clinical setup to check the name and id because there are chances that the patient walks in with the wrong report or like by mistakenly such a one gets uploaded in the emr then comes the patient's age ensure the date of date of birth is a correct entry because the patient sensitivities is being compared to the normal individuals of the same age we also have a uh, have to make sure that the refractive correction given is appropriate as an uncorrected refractive error can result in abnormal fields similarly check for the pupil size as well as a myotic pupil less than 2 mm uh, or so can give incorrectly constricted fields with respect to the test details we have to look at the test pattern and strategy of choice the type of fixation target as well as the stimulus description with respect to the stimulus grid pattern conventional protocols in hfa focus on the central field that include the central fixation and the near periphery okay uh, that may include 30-2 24-2 10-2 and macular threshold with different number of test locations and difference in degree of spacing between each as shown here in the table in this the first number represents the area of testing in degrees if i take an example of 30-2 it evaluates 30 degrees on either side of the fixation to understand what is the second number that is 2 Uh, what it denotes we have to quickly recollect the anatomical aspects of retina here on the right side you see the papillomacular bundle which constitutes of the retinal ganglia ganglion cells the rgcs that carry the information from the macula that is the central retina to the optic nerve okay and here you see the horizontal raphe the demarcation line extending from the macula dividing the temporal retinal nerve fiber layer into a superior and inferior half so in these test protocols which i mentioned 30-2 24-2 etc the 
central horizontal points are distributed at equal distances from the horizontal raphe on either side of its uh, on either of its sides that is above and below so the digit 2 denotes the points are on either side of the horizontal line so now you know what is the first number and what the second number denotes what about the test strategies? The test strategies include full threshold, fast pack, and SITA. Under the SITA strategy, it can be standard, fast, faster, or SWAC. After the introduction of SWITA, the older strategies are seldom used because of their long test durations. Zone 1 also give us, uh, gives us the detail about the type of fixation target chosen. That can be a central target, small or large diamond, as well as the information of about the size of peripheral stimuli, whether it is a size three, five, uh, chosen based on the uh, based on the patient's visual status. Okay, so we have completed zone one. Now moving on to zone two. Zone two basically provides. Uh, as the reliability indices such as fixation loss, false negative and false positives. Why do we need reliability indices? Because HFA is actually relying on the patient's response. That is a subjective response. Hence, we need to have some kind of cross checks to ensure whether we can really trust the responses or not. Or we are going to end up with false interpretations if we really is not focusing on the reliability index. So the first one is fixation loss, which means it is a check for knowing whether the patient was accurately fixating at the central target or not. In HFA, this score is estimated by using hale Krako blind spot monitoring method by presenting stimuli at the patient's blind spot. Please remember that the blind spot is that area in the visual field corresponding to the optic nerve head with the no photoreceptors, hence an absolute scotoma. So any positive response from the patient to such stimuli is an indication of instable central, vision, central fixation. So if the machine projects a stimulus onto the blind spot, say uh, 10 times, and the patient responds to uh, it as three of those stimuli, for example, it would be recorded as three out of 10 as a fraction. Two other measures of fixation uh, reliability with automated visual fields are, uh, not fixation, the overall reliability with automated visual fields are false positives and false negatives. The false positive error scores uh, actually measures the tendency of a patient to press the response button in the absence of a presented stimulus, an indication of usually a trigger happy patient. False positive responses uh, that grades are presented as a fraction of percentage of incorrect patient responses, and any scores exceeding 15% may indicate compromised test results. The false negative error scores measures the tendency of a patient to give no response when retesting a previously tested location with a stimulus brighter than uh, the measured threshold value. And this usually indicates an inattentive patient. So please remember fixation loss, false positives, and false negatives get to tell you something regarding the reliability of the report. Uh, Zone 2 also has foveal threshold in decibels and test duration in minutes. We should always look at the patient's visual acuity and compare it with the foveal threshold. Visual sensitivity is expected to be best of the fovea, hence we expect the highest decibel value of the, uh, at the foveal region. So now we have cleared the first two steps of wonder. We know how to check for patient and test details as well as the reliability criteria. Now we will move on to the next zones and see whether the report is normal or abnormal.
Zone 3 contains the numerical plot and the grayscale. So as I mentioned to you before, the instrument measures the retina's ability. That is the retinal sensitivity to detect a stimulus at specific locations. How HFA tells us about the sensitivity? It is by estimating the thresholds. It is the intensity of the stimulus which, when uh, presented to a particular location, has probability of being detected 50% of the time. Here, this plot displays the recorded threshold sensitivities in decibels, denoted as dB. dB value and brightness is inversely related. That means 50 decibel is the dimmest, maximally diminished target that the perimeter can project, and 0 decibel being the brightest one. Likewise, sensitivity and threshold is inversely proportional. Um, if I want to tell you an example from a real life uh, situation, most of you would have seen uh, small babies cry so bitterly when they receive injections, right? They are highly sensitive. They are unable to bear even a low intensity of pain. That means for pain, they have high sensitivity and low threshold. But at the same time, if a grown-up person might be less sensitive to uh, injections pain, I, I hope most of you. So it is a case of low sensitivity and a high threshold. So if it is high sensitivity, it is low threshold and vice versa. Uh, the grayscale uh, of the numerical plot, uh, what you see in zone 3, is a graphical representation of the recorded threshold sensitivities in the, numer uh, in the numeric scale. So regions of decreased sensitivities are displayed in darker tones and it shows white scotomas when there is high false positive errors which usually occur in trigger happy patients as discussed earlier. And we see clover leaf pattern, the picture that you are seeing in the middle, usually associated with excess false negative errors. Please remember not to use a grayscale for making any diagnosis, but it can be used, uh, used while you are demonstrating the patient the kind of visual field defect they have. So what zone 3 give, uh, gives us is the threshold plot displaying the recorded values for that particular individual. But how will we know it is within normal limits? We have to remember that the retinal sensitivity is expected to decline with increasing age. Hence, an age-matched comparison is essential. HFA has its own normative database and the machine's algorithm compares individual threshold values with the database. Then it finds out how much each location-based values are different or deviated from the expected values. These deviations are displayed in zone 4 and it is called as a total deviation plot. Let me call it as a TD plot. So just like the zone 3, this plot also has a numerical plot where you see numbers and a probability plot. So the first one that you are seeing on your left side is the numerical total deviation plot where the negative values indicate sensitivities that are below the age corrected sensitivity and positive values indicate higher than normal sensitivity. The significance of these deviations from normal are indicated in the associated DD probability plot, in which sensitivities that are worse than uh, those found in 5%, 2%, 1%, and 0.5% of normal subjects of the same age as the patient are highlighted with appropriate thin. For example, if I take a 5% sample, it specifies that fewer than 5% of normal individuals have that low sensitivity. Along with this, a key showing the meaning of symbols is given at the bottom of the printout. So, that, uh, so what it shows uh, us is the overall deviation or I will put it as generalized depression of the visual field that can be possibly due to cataract, any other medial opacities or meiosis. 
Okay. If if there is a presence of generalized loss that can mask or hide a localized glaucomatous defect, hence the machine adjusts for overall depression of the visual field and displays the presence of any localized scotomas in zone 5 and it is called as pattern deviation plot. Like the TD plot, the pattern deviation plot is also provided as a numerical plot as well as a probability plot. Probably these images might help for a better understanding. Um, here I would like to give a few real life situations in parallel. Suppose uh, you're walking on a road. You will be able to see, uh, look around and see if there is any gutter or small pits on it, right? But what if the road is flooded? Imagine there is a constant water level a few inches uh, above your ankles. In such a situation, will you be able to see any pit that is on the road? No, right? Because it is masked or hidden by the overall level of water. Same thing happens when someone has a generalized reduction of sensitivity along with a localized scotoma. The overall depression has to be removed to spot that localized scotoma. That is what is done in a pattern deviation plot. It adjusts for the overall depression and sensitivity and helps us to identify the location and the depth of the localized defect. Then comes the zone 6, displaying the global indices such as mean deviation, the MD, the pattern standard deviation, the PSD, and the visual field index, the VFI. The MD is average of all the numbers in the total deviation plot. MD can range from plus 2 to say minus 30 decibels, but it usually has a negative sign. In a case of generalized or advanced defect, the report will show a high MD, but this value will be very small or comparatively smaller when there is a small localized defect. Whereas positive, uh, uh, you may see positive MD as well if it is a hypersensitive or a trigger happy patient. Then comes the PSD. PSD is an index that has a positive sign and that gives us an idea about the similarity of the patient's field to the shape of the hill of vision. Low PSD indicates a normal shape of hill, whereas a high value indicates a disturbed shape of hill. A localized defect, which is usually seen in case of glaucoma, will have a high PSD, whereas a generalized defect will have a low PSD. So, uh, to give you an example, if the patient has cataract and no glaucoma, the report will show a high MD, but probably a normal PSD. The third global in uh, index is the VFI, which is relatively a new index that ranges from 0 to 100%, with 100 being normal and 0 indicating a perimetrically blind person. Since all this global indices are interrelated, they should be considered together for interpretation purposes. Moving on to zone 7, the glaucoma hemifield test, the GHT. What the algorithm does is, based on the anatomical arrangement of the retinal nerve fiber layer, it segregates the tested visual field area into 10 sectors, 5 sectors in the superior, and its mirror pairs in the inferior hemisphere. This uh, zone pattern was optimized for the diagnosis of glaucomatous visual field damage, basically. So the test conducts a pairwise vector comparison and it looks for asymmetry in sensitivity. Why do they look for asymmetry? Is asymmetry in the number of abnormal points in any of the five defined regions between the upper and lower hemifield is common in glaucomatous field. After determining the asymmetry, GHD gives output message as with the normal limits, generalized reduction in sensitivity or GRS, borderline outside normal limits or abnormally high sensitivity. 
last zone is where we see the gaze tracking signal. HFA has uh, an installed gaze tracking system which continuously monitors the direction of a patient's gaze. So here in the signal on your right side, uh, the line indicating upward, uh, the, the line that is extending upward indicates the amount of gaze error or fixation loss of 10 degree or more. And lines extending downward indicate the unsuccessful measurement of gaze direction, probably due to uh, a blink. Uh, this signal output can also be used as a reliability measure for checking fixation stability. Especially to glaucoma, there is a proposed criterion for detecting glaucomatous field loss, and that is termed as the Anderson's criteria that considers the GHT output message, the PST, and at least three or more non-edge points that are defective. Now we know whenever we receive a report, we have to look for patient demographics, test specifications, see whether the report is reliable, reliable by considering the reliability indices, fixation loss, false positive, false negative, as well as the gaze tracking signal. Then see if the report is normal or abnormal by inspecting the different zones. It can be a generalized defect that is present only in the total deviation plot, or it can be a combination of both general and local defect depending upon the ocular condition of the patient. Now we will see what are the common defect patterns that we might come across while inspecting an HFA report. Glaucomatous visual field defects uh, commonly take the form of nasal step, paracentral scotoma, an arcuate defect, otherwise called as a germ scotoma, or a tunnel vision in the advanced stage of the disease. These defects are named based on the location and the extent. So, this functional defect happens in correspondence with the structural defect. For example, if the damage is happening to the superior arcuate fibers, just to revise, arcuate fibers are those originating from the temporal uh, macular and peripheral retinal area that flows like an uh, arch above and below and joins the inferior and superior part of the optic disc. So anything to do with the superior fibers, if they are damaged, then we will see a corresponding visual field defect that is an inferior arcway scrotum. Visual field defects uh, with, which are associated with other conditions, especially uh, neuroophthalmic diseases like optic neuritis, toxic optic neuropathies, uh, or compressive lesions as in pituitary adenoma, etc. Uh, like in such cases, they may appear as central or secocentral scotomas, bitemporal or homonymous hemianopathy. Okay. Uh, I have put a couple of examples. So let's try to interpret uh, a few reports. Okay. Please look at the report. See. It is a writer report of patient that was performed using CIPA standard 24-2 protocol. Looking at the reliability indices, false uh, fixation loss is slightly on the higher side, but uh, for well the rest of the reliability indices are good. For well threshold is correlating with the visual acuity. Looking at the total deviation and the pattern uh, deviation plots, we see multiple defective uh, points. Is it temporal or nasal? You see the location of blind spot here. So this is the temporal side. So what you're seeing, the defective points are on your nasal side. Okay. So possibly it is a nasal visual field defect, suggestive of glaucoma. But please remember, you have to clinically correlate with the structural alteration and then come to a conclusion. Moving on to the next report. This is 
again a writer report of a patient that was performed using CETA standard 24-2 protocol. Looking at the reliability indices, they are well within the acceptable limits. Even the fixation laws, false positive, false negative. And if you look at the bottom of the report, the gay signals are also pretty good. Four-wheel threshold is correlating well with the visual acuity. GHT says it is a borderline or a generalized reduction in sensitivity. Looking at the total deviation plot, we see a generalized defect, but the pattern deviation seems fairly normal. So it is possibly a case of cataract or any other medial opacity and not associated with glaucoma. Again, we have to clinically correlate. Here in the next report, this is a left eye report of a patient that was performed using CETA standard 24-2 protocol. Looking at the reliability indices, they are well within the acceptable limits. Fovil threshold is correlating well with visual acuity. GHT says it is outside normal limit. Look at the total deviation plot. We see a severely depressed fields. And in such cases, HFA doesn't project the pattern deviation plot. So this is probably suggestive of an advanced glaucoma. So please remember, clinically you have to correlate with other signs. Here is the next report. Here we have a left eye report on the left side and right eye reports on the right side. It is done using a 30-2 CETA standard protocol, fairly reliable fields. There is a pretty uh, similar pattern of field defects in both the eyes uh, that is evident in the total deviation as well as the pattern deviation plot. So when we see a defect that is involving the temporal side of the left eye and temporal side of the right eye, we call it as a bi-temporal hemianopia. Possibly a case of, uh, for example, chiasmal compression uh, that can be due to a tumor which is probably a pituitary adenoma or a pituitary tumor that is compressing the nasal fibers which are at the chiasm and causing a bitemporal defect. And here is two more examples. This is the uh, this is the left eye and this is the right eye. Uh, we see defective points on the nasal side of the left eye and temporal side of the right eye. We call it as a right homonymous hemianopia. And in this, uh, in, in the next case, it is a left homonymous hemianopia. I would like to mention a few common artifacts that we might see in field analysis printouts, such as those caused by lens swim and uh, meiotic pupils. So for example, let's look at this particular report of a 61 years old patient with a refractive error of plus 4.5 actors. And we are able to see a ring scotoma in both of the plots, which is evident in the total deviation as well as the pattern deviation plot. This is possibly caused by the thick lens ring that was uh, obstructing the his or her vision at the side. So this is an example of a lens artifact. Look at, uh, uh, let's look at one more example where the patient had a pupil diameter of 2.1 mm and look at the pattern deviation plot which is, a dip, uh, you see several depressed points in both the hemisphere which was significantly improved after dilating the pupils and making it as a 5.5 mm pupil. Um, HFA not only gives a single field analysis report, but also has various programs for estimating and predicting progression of glaucoma. It uh, doesn't seem, uh, doesn't really seem to be practical to include progression analysis in this session, but I would like to at least make a mention about the same. Progression analysis can be done subjectively or using statistical approaches. In the statistical method, that can be done based on global ETSs such as MD and VFI, and also by following trend or event analysis. 
Here is a few additional piece of information. HFA not only has a monocular field estimation, but also binocular testing uh, method termed as Esterman field test. And not only a static testing method, but also offers a kinetic test protocol. As a latest advancement, the recent version of HF HFA has a liquid trial lens instead of a full field lens, the full aperture lens, and it has capability of autofocusing and correcting the refractive error up to eight directors. And along the CETA standard and CETA fast, at present, each of our version has one more add on called the CETA faster, which, as its name suggests, it is faster in test duration than CETA fast. Um, if you would like to explore about Esterman field test, I would recommend to go through this article. You can please note down the same. Um, I know I have, uh, though I have talked about uh, many aspects in relation to HFA, uh, please note that perimetry itself is an extensive topic. And if you are a beginner, please take uh, a look at these two articles as my personal recommendation for reading and making a better understanding. Um, Though this session had a prime focus on HFA as it is one of the widely used perimetry technique, I would like to mention about some of the selected alternate approaches in the field of automated perimetry. These are either out there in the market for commercial use, while some of them are lab-based prototypes that are under development and validation process. First one is the frequency doubling perimetry, abbreviated as FTP which is largely recommended for screening purposes with its test grid containing 17 test locations and uses a scoring system called Robin score for estimating the integrity of the visual field. The manufacturers has recently launched the uh, high-end version of FTP that is a revised version of the conventional FTP and it is called as Humphrey, Humphrey Matrix Field Analyzer. Next, coming to eye movement perimetry, EMP, which relies on saccadic eye movements to evaluate the functional integrity of the visual system. Unlike my previous reading recommendations and references, these references in particular bring me pride and happiness as this particular prototype and publications are from the research team to which I belong to. So what basically EMP does is it evaluates reflexive eye movements initiated towards randomly projected peripheral stimuli and quantifies the saccadic reaction time, the SRT. That uses a, it is recorded using a remote infrared eye tracking camera, based on which the responsiveness of the visual field is estimated. We have already published uh, regarding the delay in reaction times observed in glaucoma patients and using SRT as an index for detecting functional loss associated with glaucoma. We have also observed delayed reaction times in neuroophthalmic patients, and we are currently involved in evaluating the potential of EMP in binocular visual field estimation. Uh, this is another recently reported perimetry prototype exclusively designed for visual field estimation in pedi pediatric uh, patients. Uh, specifically infants. Probably those of you who have already listened to Dr. Premendri Ma'am would have got a clear picture on this innovative approach. Uh, the, the research team have been uh, able to use this device to quantitatively estimate the visual fields for infants and also on patients for whom testing was not possible with conventional perimeters. Recently, various uh, manufacturers have come up with VR-based perimetry uh, devices, which features portable and convenient method of perimetric technique, especially for screening purposes. Uh, apart from this, a growing number of uh, inexpensive methods of visual field testing have been developed recently that include uh, applications used with smart tablets, for example, uh, 
Melbourne Rapid Fields and Visual Fields Easy, for example, and even uh, computer based programs for uh, say an example of rare bit uh, perimetry, etc. Uh, these innovations actually are from the increased overall demand for IK services by an aging population. Um, from all those you were listening to so far, I would like to make a uh, to take a summary and give a take home message. All the high end diagnostics, including ophthalmic imaging modalities, might not be accessible to everyone, especially when uh, you are put in a smaller clinical setup or if you are an uh, independent practitioner. Still, our integral, integral role in uh, detecting not only the sight threatening diseases like glaucoma, but also life threatening conditions can be very well met by including comprehensive yet focused clinical history to reach a tentative clinical diagnosis, followed by a careful optometry evaluation, including visual acuity, refraction, pupillary evaluation, very, very, very important, color vision if indicated, and a thorough anterior and posterior segment evaluation. Put down your key findings from all your preliminary evaluation, assess and correlate the significant findings with a sense of logical reasoning and then decide an appropriate reference to an ophthalmologist. That it really doesn't matter if you don't have access to high-end diagnostics, you have still the possibilities to refer them to any of the accessible um, diagnostic centers and promote the quality of your individual practice. But it is very essential for us to have at least some basic understanding about the common uh, diagnostic reports that we may come uh, across. So at least the very commonly used diagnostic and imaging modality report interpretation should be in our reach. That is uh, all from me. Thank you so much for your patient listening and wishing you all to stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Optum Najia. Uh, we have few questions for you to answer. May I start? Uh, yes, sure. Yeah, the first question is from Mr. Singaravelu, sir. Uh, what is white scotoma? Okay. So, uh, thank you for the question, first of all. Uh, the uh, white scotomas are basically what you, uh, we just call it based on the color tone, the gray scales are using. So what I was telling about zone three, the grayscale uh, image, hope you remember. So that basically uses, if it is a defective point, then it uses a darker tone. And if it is a high sensitive point, then it uses a white, whiter shade of tone. So when the patient has, uh, for example, a trigger happy patient, if he's continuously pressing for whatever stimulus he's seeing, whether he's he's seeing or not seeing and if the higher sensitivity levels are detected those areas in the grayscale will appear like bleached out or in a very white shade and that we call it as a white scotoma so it is basically a, a index that you can look for uh, the reliability of the reports uh, the next question is from kartia lokanathan in okay. cases of elderly patients or myotic pupils or cataract, we dilate the patient. Does this dilation have any effect of blur on the visual field sensitivity? Okay, that is a very good question. Okay. Uh, see, it is not really mandatory to have a dilated examination in, uh, during the Humphrey uh, uh, procedure, especially when we are dealing with the young adults. But if it is a older patient, especially when they have medial opacities or at least the early changes of the uh, lenses with respect to cataract or anything, uh, we notice that when it is an undilated situation, we have a very uh, like low uh, threshold values. So it is always better to dilate and uh, then proceed with the examination when you are dealing with older patients. And uh, 
it it won't be there won't be any blurring because we are anyway correcting them with the accurate refractive uh, correction so and uh, moreover the same pd should be maintained for all the uh, field visits because uh, the, in order to evaluate the glaucoma progression we should have a pd that is set so either you have an undilated condition for all throughout the evaluation or uh, you have a dilated pupil condition for all your evaluations okay uh, the next question is from devakani suresh um, she wants to know who are the ideal patients for swap visual field testing is this done only once at patient's first visit okay uh, swap was uh, uh, is a blue on uh, yellow perimetry that was in practice uh, say before 10 years which was widely in practice and was uh, recommended as a method that can uh, help us in early detection of glaucoma but currently the swab program is completely obsolete and we are no longer using that particular program in the clinics okay yeah um the next is uh, from sangeeta nagarajan uh, could you explain why psd in, is low in case of advanced field loss in spite of md showing high negative value okay yeah that's a good question thank you um See, basically what MD and PSD is, they are calculated from the total deviation plot. So I will give you two or three uh, scenarios. Just imagine if the patient has a normal visual field. So in the total deviation plot, you're going to see uh, the deviation values that are pretty close to zero, say minus one, zero, plus one, or at the maximum minus two or something. So if you average it, you get an MD value that is very Even the PSD value, which tells us the irregularities in the visual field. So how close these deviation values are to each other. So in the normal patient, both MD and PSD is going to be very close to zero. But in case there is a generalized reduction in sensitivity or it's like an overall depression, you see uh, the numericals in the total deviation plots are quite high, say minus 10, minus 11. And if you average them and take an MD, that is also going to be high. But what happens to PSD? These all locations are equally depressed. That means there is no as such difference between the values. So PSD may remain very close to zero or at least a small positive number, but the MD will be high. But in case of uh, local defect, you see a cluster of points in one particular quadrant or something that are very highly deviated from the rest of the fields. That means the MD, which is the average of all the 52 locations, are not going to change much, at least not in a significant way. But the PSD, which tells you uh, how much these locations are away from the rest of the location, so that irregularity uh, shows you a high PSD. So MD is more towards the generalized depression, but the PSD is more towards the localized defect in the visual field. Uh, uh, Mr. Arul has two questions. One is how about contact lenses which can reduce lens artifact? And uh, the second one is indications for full field, 120 full field threshold test. Okay, will you repeat the second part yeah, of the question? Yeah, oh, you can just answer the first one. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. How about contact lenses which can reduce lens artifact? Yeah, usually when uh, the uh, recommended refractive lens is above uh, seven diopters, we go for a contact lens because uh, otherwise the thick edge of the lens is going to create rim artifacts. So we do use contact lens if it is a high uh, refractive error. So I think that question yeah. is uh, and, yeah. And the second uh, second part is indications for full 120 full field threshold test. Uh, that is a protocol that we regularly don't uh, do in the clinics because we usually look at the central fixation and the near periphery, which is within the 30 degrees for glaucoma, even the neuroophthalmic cases, but. Uh, 
full field 120 degree is a potential choice for neuroophthalmic uh, patients if you want to evaluate their extreme peripheral vision. Uh, the next question again from Mr. Arul. How often tests need to be repeated? Uh, is it repeated in a single visit or how often you should call the patient for the yeah. treatment? I think how often we need to call the patient for that. Okay. okay. The, uh, basically, the period of follow-up for a, say, glaucoma patient depends on various factors especially the age, the amount of structural damage that he has, the what uh, integrity of his visual field at present and how fast is he progressing structurally and functionally. So all this, uh, even the life expectancy of the patient, if it is a young one, then you have to follow them up frequently. If it is an older patient, probably once in six months. So many factors are put together to decide how often you want to call the patient in case of glaucoma. But if it is a neuroophthal patient, again, for example, if it is an optic neuritis patient, uh, the first visit you're putting them on uh, IV or steroids, then maybe one after a week he's called back and maybe after a month he's uh, called back for review. So depending on the condition and various other factors, the follow-up time will vary. Okay. Uh, the next question I'm is... not able to switch on my video. Yeah, it's, okay. it's all flickering. It's okay. Uh, the next question is from Akshaya Vyasan. Uh, when pupil is, is in dilated state, how blur effect plays role in perimetry visual field examination and how will be response how will be the response from the patient? I think this question was uh, answered for Kartya, I guess. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, oh, it's, it's okay. Probably now she's clear after the yeah. first answer. Uh, the next one is from Preeta Ramprasad. Uh, values in parenthesis and dash 2, as in 24-2 or 30-2, what do these signify? The uh, second number that is in 30-2 and 10-2, as I was mentioning before, the second number indicates that the location of the test locations are on either side of the axis. They are not actually falling on the vertical or the horizontal meridian, but on either side. So above or below or right or left. That is what is minus two indicates. Okay. Uh, next question is from Preeti Murugan. Uh, is STMR binocular vision test reliable? Are we practicing now? Uh, very good. Um, Estimate uh, perimetry is a widely used technique, especially when dealing with uh, uh, visual field estimation for driving license exams, especially abroad. Uh, Estimate is uh, a package that will come with certain models of uh, HFA. So if we want to practice it, then we can uh, ask the company for uh, a license and we can activate the program. So it is basically a, a 120 test point locations where we get yes or no responses. It is not a thresholding program, but a binary response method. And it is actually in practice. Uh, I'm not sure whether we do it often in India, but yes, abroad it is in practice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the next one is... Uh... Then Raju, uh, can you explain the difference between pattern deviation and corrected pattern deviation? Uh, corrected pattern deviation is actually comes with the previous strategies that HFA had, like full threshold and fastback programs. So CPST, we call it. It is uh, in those uh, particular strategies they evaluate the short term fluctuations of threshold. So within a particular test, how much is the uh, short-term uh, fluctuation of that particular point? So PST, when corrected for the short-term fluctuation, we call it as a CPST. So it won't be available in CETA because CETA is not evaluating that short-term fluctuation, but it is available in uh, full threshold and the fastback programs. Okay. Uh, I guess that's all the questions we have. 
thank you Najee and I hand over to Kumaran sir. Thank you so much. Uh, we, on behalf of OATN, I take this opportunity to thank our young dynamic moderator, Ms. Nada Balaji. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, madam. And uh, no doubt, uh, the future doctor, Dr. Nazia, has explained the uh, field analyzer, the readings, the different stages so beautifully, wonderfully. And people like me with, uh, I think, uh, 40 years back, I've done my optometry and it is a great revision for me. And as I'm like to uh, thank uh, Ms. Nazia, I just want to ask a small question and then we'll close it. Uh, like in the, uh, we are all uh, private practitioners and where we don't have any kind of uh, instrument to do a field analyzing for the patients. So what do you recommend for people like us who are independent practitioners where we don't have field analyzers with us? Okay, so, um, if, if we don't have access to the high-end diagnostic ones, at least a gross estimation using a um, tangent screen or a confrontation method will at least give us an idea about the integrity of the visual field. And uh, if the clinical characteristics, say structural def defect you are seeing, which is a definite structural defect and you expect that there can be a functional deficit associated with it, we can even uh, advise the patient or refer them to a diagnostic center or a tertiary eye care center probably and then uh, maybe ask them to come back with a report. So some manual method of estimation or if you have a very definite uh, surety that there is going to be a functional defect by looking at the structural aspects then definitely a uh, referral even for the high-end evaluations thanks a lot i think that is a great suggestion for the independent uh, private practitioners yes. where you cannot you can do the confrontation method and uh, have a uh, connect with the diagnostic centers and also the treasury hospital where we can refer the patients. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Nazia. You, are, you have given us, enlightened us with a uh, lot of information, input related HVF. And uh, I'm sure uh, all our members uh, and the people who have attended the sessions on YouTube are probably who are going to view after this session. Normally, we get to see about close to 700 to 800 people view our YouTube, and uh, they are all going to get benefited, and it is going to be available throughout in our uh, YouTube channel. Thanks a lot. And, uh, thank you I, so much, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You.